So far, we've looked at the diode, the triode, and the pentode. Uh, but before we go on and we start building circuits and logic gates with those tubes, there's one more tube that I do want to take a look at, and that is, well, that's this little guy right here. Uh, this is a 6BE6, and it is a heptode. Uh, you'll also often see these called a pentagrid converter. And I, I don't actually have that many of these. Of the several hundred tubes that I have sitting in a, in a box out there, I only have about maybe eight or ten of these. And so they're not as common, but they're, they're a really unique tube, and uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on inside. So let's, let's hop over to the bench and see if we uh, can take a look inside and see what's going on. So we'll go ahead and start by drawing our plate up top here, and we'll draw a cathode down here. Now, like always, this cathode is uh, powered by a little heater, and that heater uh, for the 6B6 that we're using is, like always, powered by 6.3 volts. Uh, and if we were to just stop here, again, this is, this is just a diode. So di means two, and ode is short for electrode, so two electrodes. And, uh, you know, that's what we covered a long time ago. So if we add in a little grid, grid along the bottom here, well, that is now three elements, one, two, three. So that makes it a triode. And, uh, well, let's just, let's keep adding grids in. Let's add in another grid right here. And, well, that's now four elements, so that makes it a, uh, a tetrode. And then we add in one more element here. And now we got five elements. So one, two, three, four, five. And this is a pentode. And this is, uh, well, this is everything that we've covered up to now. But what's really interesting about the heptode, uh, and I think that the name probably gives away what's going on here, hepta or heptal can mean seven. Uh, so it has seven active elements inside of it. So we've got five already here. So let's, let's go ahead and throw another two grids in there. And there you go, that's a heptode. That's, well, that's pretty wild looking. There's, uh, what, what are we gonna do with five grids? And actually the fact that there's five grids gives us a little insight as to the other name. And the other name is called a, uh, a pentagrid converter. And uh, well, penta means five and then grid is grid. So there's five grids, but Man, what's going on with all this? That's, that's a lot of grids. That's a lot of things to, to think about, right? Well, it's actually easiest if you just think of this as two pentodes stuffed into one package sharing a plate, a cathode, and a suppressor grid. All right? So this top grid up here is our suppressor grid. And uh, remember, it, it has a... Uh, low charge, so our suppressor grid here is actually within the tube tied to our cathode here. So, and its its job is that as the electrons fly up here, when they hit the plate, sometimes they knock off some other electrons. You get some secondary emission, and the uh, the suppressor grid here stops that secondary emission. And then you'll notice that we have four grids left, and it's easiest to think of this as two sets of two grids. Uh, so we can, we can see here that this is going to be a control grid. So we'll call that control grid one. Uh, and then if we go up to, we have another control grid. So we'll call this control grid two. And then just like before, we have two grids here, just like on the pentode. And each, each one of these, both of these are screen grids and they're, they're the screen grid for the control grid directly below it so you know this is uh this is screen grid one and this is screen grid two now our vacuum tube is is only a, a seven pin this this little 6b6 here is just a it's a little sub miniature tube and well we only have seven pins but uh, you notice that we have a, a bunch of active elements going on inside of here well there's there's seven active elements plus a heater so, well, our suppressor grid's tied to the cathode internally, so that, that saves one thing. And, you know, both of these screen grids, all they're gonna do is they're gonna get tied to plus B, and they're gonna get tied through a little resistor. So there's no reason that those can't be connected as well. And actually, inside the tube, they are. 
they're connected and then you know we can we can pull this out and run that up through a resistor to our positive voltage and so that's where our seven pins come from on our on our tube we have uh, one pin for the plate uh, our second pin is for the cathode and then we have three and four for the uh, heater and then we've got a control grid another control grid and then the screen grid and that makes seven pins total and so what this does is it creates a pretty interesting situation. Each control grid acts like a gate to block the electrons flowing all the way up to the, the plate. So the electrons can only flow to the plate if both control grids are not negative, if they're receiving a positive charge. Uh, so if, if either one of these has a negative charge, it's going to repel those electrons and keep them from making it up to the plate. And so this, this allows a lot of really complex behavior to happen. For example, you can have uh, two signals going on. You can have, you know, for example, you can have one signal like this. And then you can have one signal like this. And you'll notice that this right through here is the only time that both signals are high. So, if, you know, if we say that this is a, a logic low and then this is a logic high up here, the plate will only receive those electrons, meaning the tube will only be conducting when both of these signals go high. So we have a very interesting way to control how the tube conducts. And so, well, this is, man, this is really neat. I, I think it would be a lot of fun to play with this on the breadboard. And so I, I do, actually. I have, a, I have a setup on the breadboard. So go ahead and pull this out of the way, and I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you how I've got it set it up. I'll just, I'll just draw the circuit out here right quick. So you can see this is how we have the circuit set up on the breadboard. Coming into the plate, we have a 10,000 ohm resistor, and we'll check the output coming off of the plate right here. Uh, and the suppressor grid and the cathode are actually connected up to ground, while well, the suppressor grid is tied to the cathode internally. Uh, both of the screen grids are pulled high with a 100 ohm resistor. And then for both of the control grids, we have this kind of set up with some switches here. Now, I, I wrote it as switching 24 volts on or off, uh, but I actually have it switching between 6 volts and 24 volts uh, because that's a little more representative of the type of signals that this would receive. And I've got this uh, kind of voltage divider network going on here that's two 33,000 uh, ohm resistors. Uh, this one's biased to negative 12 volts on both of them, and then we have a 4.7 thousand ohm uh, resistor as our grid resistor. And so what this should do is we, we shouldn't see the output here go low unless both of these switches go high. Uh, so that's this is a, a pretty interesting circuit, and I think it might be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and pull the breadboard out and see if we can play with this a little bit. Okay, so here we have the breadboard set up, and we've got uh, my little 6BE6 heptode here. Uh, and it's hooked up just like we, we showed in the schematic. There's two little switches here, and these are our inputs to the two control grids. Uh, if the switches are to the right, that's 6 volts. If they're to the left, that's 24 volts input. And then these are two little uh, resistor networks, or 33,000 ohms and 4.7 thousand ohm resistor networks that go to each of the control grids. Uh, and then the the plate resistor is this little 10,000 ohm resistor here, and we have our little 100 ohm resistor here to pull the screen grid up. And then we'll check the output on this little red wire right here. And uh, instead of pulling the oscilloscope out and, and looking at it like we did last time, I thought it would be fun to play with this little National Radio Institute vacuum tube voltmeter that I got. This, this actually uh, has two vacuum tubes inside and gives a, a really smooth sweep um, with, with changing voltage. And I don't know, I've been having a lot of fun playing with this, but uh, because it's got two vacuum tubes inside it, it does actually take a little while to warm up. Uh, I was looking at the manual and they say when, when you're zeroing everything out and you're doing uh, adjustments on it, they say to let it warm up for five minutes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite that patient, but uh, we'll, we'll let it warm up. So I'll go ahead and flip the switch here to let it warm up. And uh, I want my little 6B6 here to be warming up as well. So I'll go ahead and flip the switch on my power supply. 
Now on our voltmeter here, you'll notice that the, the needle is, is all the way here buried on the left. And as the tubes warm up, that needle's gonna move up slowly closer and closer to zero. Uh, and then once I'm happy with, with how warm it is, I can adjust it directly to zero with this little knob down here. But it takes a little bit to warm up, so we'll, we'll give, it a, give it some time here. Well, it seems to be staying pretty close to zero, so we'll, we'll go ahead and take some measurements with it. And I, I just want to make sure that it's, it's reading correctly. So I'm on the 30 volt scale and I'm on the, the DC plus scale here. So if I, if I take my little probe and I, I check my power rail here, that should be 24 volts. So if we check it here, yeah, look at that. Almost 20, 24 volts exactly. That's, that's awesome. So we know it's reading well. Let's, well, let's check to see that it's reading negative voltage uh, correctly as well. So I'll move it over to minus DC. We'll, we'll re-zero it. And we should be uh, expecting 12 volts. So that should be right up around here somewhere. So we'll, we'll go ahead and check the, the negative voltage rail. Yeah, look at that, 12 volts on the money. That's, that's perfect. So great, this thing is this thing's reading really well. So we'll leave it on positive voltage here and I'll, I'll, I'll zero it out again. Cause that's, that's kind of what we're expecting out of our output here. And uh, we're expecting at least 20 volts, maybe more out of the output. So I'm gonna leave it on the 30 volt scale here. And uh, I'll tell you what, we'll just, we'll, we'll go ahead and check the output. That's gonna be this little red wire here. So I'll just touch that to the little red wire. Look at that, 24 volts on the output. Awesome, that works great. So let's, let's flip one switch. It didn't move at all. All right, so I'll move that switch back and I'll flip the other switch. Well, look at that, we, we actually did get a drop out of that. Not much. Each one of these little hash marks on here is a half a volt. So it looks like we're getting about a one volt drop. But I mean, uh, a change of one volt when we're starting at 24 volts is not all that much. So let's go ahead and flip both switches and see what happens. Awesome, look at that. So we dropped, we dropped all the way down to just a hair under 10 volts. So maybe about 9.8, 9.9 volts. And if I flip either switch off, we go back up. How cool is that? That's so cool. All right, so we've got, essentially we've got a, a vacuum tube that can use two inputs to give us an inverted output. But we're looking at it at voltage. If we boil it down to, to just on or off, I, I think I'm starting to see something that I recognize here. I tell you what, to make it a little easier to see, we'll, we'll just go ahead and hook up this LED. And to make sure that the LED is off when it's off, I mean, you saw we, we had 10 volts at, at logic low, so I want that logic low to be zero. Um, and so I'm gonna cheat a little bit just because it's, it's easier. And I'm gonna use uh, this little 15 volt Zener diode. So the, the breakdown voltage on this is 15 volts. So uh, if the voltage is, if our output voltage is below 15, it, sh it should be zero. And if our output voltage is above 15, it'll be whatever the difference is between what our output and 15 is. So we'll go ahead and plug that in. And uh, I don't want to burn my resistor up, so I'll, I'll use a little 10,000 ohm resistor. Uh, I don't want to burn my LED up, so I'll use a little 10,000 ohm resistor. And then we'll go ahead and um, turn both of these off and we'll hook our little LED up here and it should come on. All right, look at that. So our LED is on. If I flip one switch, the LED stays on. If I flip the other switch, the LED stays on. If I flip both switches, the LED goes off. Now, if, if we look at that like a logic output, well, now this is really interesting because we have two inputs and we have one output. And that's the basic fundamental of all logic gates. And if the output is one, unless both of the inputs are one, in which case the output goes to zero, which is exactly what we have here. Well, that's, that's actually a, a very specific type of logic gate. That is a NAND gate. And NAND gates are awesome because they're a universal gate, just like a NOR gate. And so that, what that means is that you can build any other logic gate from a combination of NAND gates. And so what our little 6BE6 vacuum tube is doing here is that it, it created a NAND gate for us. That's awesome. Look at that. So there we go, we have a one vacuum tube NAND gate. 
that is amazing. Unfortunately, I don't have all that many of these, so I can't stack too many of these up. But in certain cases where space is going to be an issue, I say space is going to be an issue, we're talking about vacuum tubes, they take up a huge amount of space. But roll with me here. In certain situations where space may be an issue, this could work really well. Now, there are other ways of achieving a NAND gate with, uh, some pinto with the pentode or, or the triode, and we'll take a look at that in, in maybe some future episodes. But for now, I'm just I'm super excited about this. That's, that's really cool. That's a lot of fun. We have a NAND gate. That's, that's awesome. Uh, so now we've, we've kicked down the door to logic gates. So let's, let's roll with this. Let's make some more logic gates. And I think, uh, I think we'll do that in the next episode. I think we'll maybe pull out the pentode or the triode again, and we'll start trying to build some logic gates, maybe some NOR gates, uh, some OR gates. Let's see what we can make from there. I think that'll be a lot of fun. In the meantime, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep playing with my NAND gate here. I think this is, this is really cool.